Welcome to lecture number 21. In this lecture and in the next one, I plan to explain yet another stable global splitting that refines a well-known and classic non-equivalent stable splitting. Indeed, the title of this lecture is an homage to Heinz Miller's classic paper that has the title Stable Splittings of Stiefel Manifolds and that in fact does exactly what the title promises. So what I want to do in this lecture and in the next is to provide global generalizations and global refinements of the non-equivalent stable splittings that Miller produces. In most of this lecture and the next, I will concentrate on one particular case, namely the global analog of the infinite orthogonal group. The stable splitting that I'll explain in that case can be generalized in at least two directions, but the methods used to prove the generalizations are very similar to the methods used in the special case. At the end of the next lecture, I'll explain what the more general statements are. The reason that I'm concentrating on the infinite orthogonal group throughout is that I want to avoid obscuring the key ideas and overloading the notation. So here's the key player. The orthogonal space O has values O of V equals O of V. So this might look like a stupid joke, but on the blackboard it's kind of hard to write math boldface letters. So in the printed sources this is a math boldface. And so this is math boldface O at V is the orthogonal group of V. So this is an orthogonal space that consists of all the orthogonal groups of all the inner product spaces. What are the structure maps? A linear isometric embedding phi from V to W induces a continuous map phi lower star, or sometimes I write O of phi from O of V to O of W. That is conjugation by phi and the identity on the complement of its image on W orthogonal complement of the image of phi. So in formulas, if you prefer that, phi lower star of A, where A is an isometry, a linear isometry of V, at phi of V plus W, where V is in V and W is in the orthogonal complement of the image of phi. And of course, every vector in W can be uniquely written in this form, so this is a full definition. And this is just phi applied to A acted on V plus W. So this is the precise formula for saying that the structure maps act by conjugation by the identity on the orthogonal complement. Let's get a little bit of a feeling of what kind of global and equivalent homotopy type this represents. The underlying space is easy. The underlying space of a non-equivalent homotopy type is just O, so the co-limit over n greater or equal to zero of the orthogonal groups, where again I'm including one orthogonal group into the next by putting a one in the matrix in the lower right corner. Equivalently, you can say these are those isometries of R infinity that are almost everywhere the identity, or more precisely, that are the identity on the complement of something finite dimensional. So this is definitely not all linear isometries of R infinity, only those which are almost everywhere the identity. How about the equivalent homotopy types that this represents? So for a compact Lie group G, the underlying G space of O is, well, this is certainly a closed orthogonal space. All the structure maps are closed embedding, so we can access the underlying G equivalent homotopy type by simply evaluating on the complete universe. So this is just the orthogonal group of the chosen complete G universe, which again, you could either say it's the co-limit over some sequence that exhausts some sequence of G sub-representations with a co-limit topology, or you could say 
These are those isometries of UG that are the identity on the complement of something finite dimensional. So this is a G space, and that represents the underlying G homotomy type. We can get a little bit of a feeling for what this G space is by identifying its G fixed points. The G fixed points are, so we have to look at the orthogonal group of the complete universe and then take the G fixed points. So this means now we're looking at linear isometries of UG that are G equivariant and the identity on the complement of something finite dimensional. G equivariant linear isometries have to preserve the isotypical decomposition into the summons indexed by irreducible representations. So this is just an infinite weak product indexed by lambda G irrep. So by isomorphism classes of irreducible real G representations. And then the orthogonal group of U lambda G fixed points where U lambda is the lambda isotypical sum end in the complete universe. After all, one way to construct the complete universe is to exactly choose representatives for the isomorphism classes of irreducible real G representations, then take each irreducible infinitely often and then sum them all up. So this is really isomorphic to lambda to the infinity. So this is the weak product. O of lambda to the infinity, G. So weak product means that it's the subspace of the product where almost all coordinates are the identity. And this comes from the fact that we're not looking at arbitrary linear isometries of UG, but only those which are the identity on the complement of something finite dimension. So this splits up as a weak product over isomorphism classes of irreducible representations of things like this. And these can also be rewritten in more familiar terms, but it depends on the type of the irreducible representation. So each of these factors, O of lambda infinity G, so you take a direct sum of infinitely many copies of this irreducible, you take its orthogonal group, and then you take the G invariant linear isometries inside. So this is isomorphic to the orthogonal group if lambda is of a real type, The infinite unitary group, if lambda is of complex type, and it's the infinite symplectic group, if lambda is of quaternionic type. What do I mean by these types? Well, if you have an irreducible representation, then it's G equivariant endomorphism ring, so the R algebra of R G linear endomorphisms of lambda has to be a skew field extension of the real numbers. So it can either be R or it's isomorphic to the complex numbers or it's isomorphic to the quaternions, and that's what these three types are. So the type depends on what the endomorphism algebra of lambda as an R G representation is. This gives us a pretty good idea of what the G equivariant homotopy type of O is and hence what the global homotopy type is that we're talking about. For example, if you wanted to calculate pi zero G, the G equivariant homotopy set of O, this would give you a formula as a weak product of pi zeros of these factors. And here, the unitary and the symplectic group, the infinite ones, are connected. So the Irreducible representations of complex and quaternionic type will not contribute. And we conclude that pi zero upper G of O is isomorphic to a direct sum of copies of Z mod 2 over lambda of real type. Because each of these irreducibles of real type contributes one factor of O, and pi zero of O is Z modulo 2. The summons and the global stable splitting of O involve the adjoint representations of the orthogonal groups. So this is a good point to remind you of what the adjoint representation of a compact Lie group is. The adjoint representation of a Lie group G 
is the Lie algebra, the tangent space at the identity element of the underlying manifold of G. However, right now we are only using the linear structure of this tangent space, so the Lie algebra also has a Lie bracket, but that's not relevant right now. It's the Lie algebra, and this is a finite dimensional R vector space with G action by the differential of the conjugation action. So every element little g of capital G gives you a smooth automorphism of G, namely by conjugating with this particular element. This fixes the identity elements, so you can differentiate it and you get a linear self-map of the tangent space. And this is continuous in the element little g in the group, and so altogether it gives you a G representation, the adjoint representation. We will be interested in the situations where G is compact, and then you can always choose an invariant in a product if need be. We will be particularly interested in the orthogonal groups, and then we will write at K for the adjoint representation of OK. And linear algebra gives a way more concrete, a way more explicit description of this that I would like to recall right now. In fact, art k is isomorphic to the vector space of those k by k real matrices that are skew symmetric. So the transpose is minus the matrix. These are skew symmetric k by k real matrices. And here the orthogonal group acts by conjugation. So strictly speaking, these are not equal, but isomorphic if this is the adjoint representation and the isomorphism is given by the exponential map. So here, if you have a matrix in here, you can send it to x x, which is the sum over n greater or equal to 0 of x to the n divided by a factorial. So the sum, in fact, converges when x comes from this vector space, um, and this lies in the orthogonal group. And if you differentiate this map, this is a linear space, it becomes an isomorphism from this linear space onto the tangent space at 1, in other words, onto the adjoint representation, and this is also equivalent for the conjugation action here and here. So this is a very concrete description of what the adjoint representation looks like in the case of the orthogonal groups. Already in the previous lecture, I had talked about global tone spaces associated with representations of compact Lie groups. In that case, the Lie groups were orthogonal groups, and they will also be today. We will also remind you a little bit more generally of what these global tone spaces are. So here's another construction that we'll need. So let W be a representation, orthogonal representation of a compact Lie group G. The global tone space associated with G and W is the following orthogonal space. So I take linear isometric embeddings out of V. So V is a faithful G representation that has nothing to do in general with the W. And then I take a disjoint base point and I smash over G with the one-point compactification of W. So this is an orthogonal space in this variable, and that is the global tone space. Here are some examples. I want to use the following notation for this that I've already indicated and used in the last lecture. I would like to write 
E global G to the W for this, the global tone space associated to the G representation W. Here are some examples. The first one motivates the notation. If I take E global G to the zero, so if I set the representation to be trivial, then this is just a zero sphere, and this becomes a global classifying space of G with a disjoint base point because it's just going to be L G comma blank modulo G with a disjoint base point added. Slightly more generally, if G acts trivially on W, then the global tone space will come out to be the global classifying space of G with a disjoint base point and then smash with SW with a trivial action. And in general, of course, the tone space is always a twisted version of a suspension. And one particular example we've already seen last time, the global classifying space of OK now to the new k, so this is the tautological representation of OK on R to the k. This is what I denoted E global OK relative to OK minus 1 last time. So this is equivalent, globally equivalent to the mapping cone of the map from the global classifying space of OK minus 1 to the global classifying space of OK and used by the standard in mapping. So this feature in the splitting of the last lecture. With all this notation in place, I can now formulate the stable global splitting of the orthogonal space O. There is an isomorphism in the global stable homotopy category. between the unreduced suspension spectrum of the orthogonal space O and the wedge over k greater or equal to zero of the suspension spectrum of the global tone spaces given by the global classifying spaces of OK for all k and then associated to the adjoint representation of k. Of course, as usual, the actual statement is a little bit better in the proof who will provide explicit maps from here to here that give you this splitting. It's just a little bit easier to state right now. Before I start with the proof, I want to make a few comments. So first of all, this is a result of my own, but I cannot yet give you a reference because at the time of the recording of this video, the paper isn't ready yet. What I plan to do is that at the point where the paper is ready, I'll add a reference and a link to the video description. So maybe if you're watching this video right now, this link is already present. The next comment is that if we take this global stable splitting in the global stable homotopy category and we apply the forgetful functor to the non equivalent stable homotopy category, we exactly get Heinz Miller's splitting or one of the splittings that he provides in his paper. Also, many of the arguments that I use are already in some sense present in Heinz Miller's paper, so the whole proof and the whole method owes a lot to this paper. In a sense, if the global formalism had already been around at that time, and if Heinz Miller had wanted to, he could have proved this splitting. Now, it might be instructive to compare this to the splitting that we proved last time and to see some of the similarities and some of the differences. Last time I proved a statement which, if you watch the video in very low resolution, might look like the same statement. Last time I proved an isomorphism between the unreduced suspension spectrum of the orthogonal space little b capital O and the wedge over k greater or equal to zero of the reduced suspension spectrum of the global classifying spaces of OK and then mu k. So there's some similarities. Obviously, the form of the splitting is very similar. Um, infinite wedge, global tone spaces over the global classifying spaces of all the orthogonal groups. What are the differences? The differences here are that BO is a global refinement of the classifying space of the infinite orthogonal group, whereas O is the infinite orthogonal group itself. So the difference on the left-hand side is non-equivalently would be 
that this is the loop space of this before you do suspension spectrum. On the right hand side, the difference is the representations that are being used. There are two very natural families of representations for the orthogonal groups. Here we're using the tautological representation, so here the underlying space is r to the k, and here we're using the adjoint representation, so that's an r vector space whose dimension is k times k minus 1 divided by 2. So they're very different representations, even the dimensions are different. I mean, this dimension grows quadratically in k, and this grows linearly in k. Also, the proof strategies and the methods of proof are very different. So I do not know of an argument that it uses one of the splittings in a formal way from the other one. So really separate arguments and separate splitting results, both of which I think are very interesting. Now, the proof of the splitting has two ingredients. So one ingredient I want to call splitting the skeleton filtration. And the other one I just want to call linear algebra. Of course, it's a little bit a fancy way of looking at linear algebra. The first item is what I plan to explain today. I will tell you a general method that splits the unreduced suspension spectrum of an orthogonal space under certain very special assumptions that have to do with the skeleton filtration. And then in the next lecture, I will verify that the assumptions that I need today are actually satisfied by the orthogonal space O, and also by various generalizations of it, which lead to generalizations of this splitting. The skeleton filtration of orthogonal spectra already made a prominent appearance in lecture 11, when I discussed the global stable model structure of the category of orthogonal spectra. The skeleton filtration is a systematic way of writing an orthogonal spectra as a co-limit of sort of truncated version or versions that are filtered by the dimension of inner product spaces. And there's a well understood way of how you can get from one filtration step to the next filtration step. I will now leave the analog of this filtration in the unstable context. So I will leave the filtration of orthogonal spaces as opposed to orthogonal spectra. Nevertheless, many things are completely parallel and I will be rather brief and omit a couple of points. You might want to rewind to lecture 11 to see how this works for orthogonal spectra and I'll do the same thing just a little bit faster. The skeleton filtration of an orthogonal space X is the sequence of orthogonal spaces and morphisms. Starting with the empty orthogonal space, which is skeleton minus 1 of X, then skeleton 0 of X. And this is actually the constant orthogonal space whose value is the value of X at 0. Then comes one skeleton somewhere is the m skeleton and they all map to x. The same caveat as in the stable situation implies that the term filtration has to be used with caution because in complete generality all these morphisms need not even be injective. However, if x is what I call flat or co in the global model structure, then this will all be closed in Bellings. So then it's really a skeleton filtration. So what is the definition of this m skeleton? The m skeleton of x is just Lm applied to x less than or equal m. Same notation as in lecture 11 for orthogonal spectra, where this is a restriction of x to the subcategory L less than or equal to m. So an orthogonal space is a continuous functor on the linear isometries category. L less than or equal to M is the full topological subcategory containing all inner product spaces of dimension at most M. You can restrict the functor from the bigger category to the smaller category, and this is left adjoint. So this is enriched Kahn extension, topological Kahn extension along the inclusion, along the inclusion from L less than or equal to M 
well. So in a sense, the skeleton contains exactly the information that is contained on the original orthogonal space on vector spaces up to dimension m, and then this information is freely extended from the left to a full orthogonal space. Some properties that I discussed in more detail in the stable context, but we will need them also. So first of all, there's a co-unit of the adjunction. which I call it IM. It goes from the M skeleton of X, which is the left adjoint applied to the right adjoint applied to X. That goes to X, and that is the morphism from here all the way to X. And with respect to these morphisms, X is a co-limit of that sequence. With a caveat that I've already mentioned that the maps need not be injective. And also, there is a systematic way how one of the skeleta is obtained from the previous one. So there are push-out squares of orthogonal spaces. Here's the m-1 skeleton mapping to the m skeleton. Here's the free orthogonal space generated by the value of x at Rm. So after all, L Rm comma blank over Om is left adjoint to evaluating at R to the M. This is the co-unit of that adjunction, of the other adjunction. And here I have to put L of Rm blank over Om. Lmx, this is the nth Latin space, and that's defined analogously as, as in the stable situation, where Lmx is just the value of the m minus 1 skeleton at r to the m, and this is the nth Latin space. of x. So the map im minus 1 evaluated at r to the m gives you an om equivariant continuous map from the latching space to the value at rm. And this I sometimes call the latching map. And this map up here is induced by this latching map uh, tensoring over om with l to the rm blank. And this is always a push out. So this means if you want to control how an orthogonal space is built and you want to control the successive steps in the skeleton filtration, you have to understand the latching objects and the latching maps. Just as in the stable situation, there is also a global model structure on the category of orthogonal spaces, where the weak equivalences are the global equivalences. And in that model structure, the cofibrant objects are what I call the flat orthogonal spaces. And these are the ones where the latching map, the map from Lmx to the value of x at r to the m, is a closed embedding and even an Om equivariant cofibration. Let me discuss two kinds of examples of the skeleton filtration. The first one is for the representative functors. And there is a very general formula for in which functors on certain indexing categories of what the skeleton looks like. And in this particular case, it comes out as follows. For an inner product space V, we have that the skeleton M of the represented orthogonal space L of V blank is either empty if the dimension of V is bigger than M, or it's all of the represented space if the dimension of V is less than or equal to M. So I have already mentioned the analogous statement in the stable context, and this is just the unstable version. More interestingly, we will need the skeleton filtration of the orthogonal space O that models the infinite orthogonal group. And here's what comes out. I claim the latching map from L M of O to O at R to the M, which is just the nth orthogonal group, is a closed embedding. The image, the 
the subspace of those matrices A in of M such that the kernel of A minus E M, the identity M times M matrices is non zero, or equivalently those A that have plus one as an eigenvalue. The way to see this is to recall a certain presentation of the logic object, which comes from the description as an enriched Khan extension. So in general, there's a co-equalizer diagram. So if you want to understand the nth legend space of X, it receives a subjection from the disjoint union K equals 0 up to N minus 1, linear isometric embeddings from R to the K into R to the M, cross the value of X at R to the K. And the map is such that when you go on with a legend map to the value at R to the M, this composite sends a pair of phi comma x to phi lower star of x. So this composite is given by the structure maps of the orthogonal space. So in particular, this disjoint union subjects onto it, which in the case of our situation, where these are all compact spaces, will say, will tell us that the image is a compact subspace and that the map is a closed map. And here you have to go from the disjoint union, 0 less than or equal to k, less than or equal to j, strictly less than m or less than equal to m minus 1 and then linear isometric embeddings from r to the j into r to the m cross linear isometric embeddings from r to the k into r to the j cross the value of x at r to the k and then there are two continuous maps in this direction. So one of the maps composes here, and the other map acts by the structure map with the linear isometric embedding of x. And these two maps are co-equalized, and that is a co-equalizer diagram. So the claim is proved by analyzing this presentation in the special case where x is the orthogonal space of orthogonal groups. I don't want to give you the argument why the legend map is injective. That is a combinatorial linear algebra argument, but we can at least see exactly what the image is. So in the special case for x equal O, the image is the same as the image of the map where here we only have the top sum end, so the image linear isometric embeddings from Rm minus 1 into Rm cross Om minus 1 onto Om. And this map sends a linear isometric embedding, comma, a matrix to the structure map applied to the matrix. And now we have to remember how this structure map was defined. The structure map was given by conjugating with phi and doing the identity of the orthogonal complement. So no matter which linear isometric embedding you take, the complement is one dimensional. So this construction gives you a matrix that is the identity on at least a one dimensional subspace. So this will have the eigenvalue plus 1 on at least a one-dimensional subspace. Conversely, if this has the eigenvalue plus 1, then you pick a one-dimensional subspace on which it is the identity, and then on the orthogonal complement, uh, you can find a pre-image under this map. So this proves the identification of the image. The injectivity is a combinatorial argument, and because this space, in the, when x is O, is compact, the map will automatically be a closed map. We need another tool from a previous lecture, in this case from lecture 13, where I discussed the forgetful functor from the global stable homotopy category to the G-equivariant stable homotopy category for G any compact Lie group. And I explained that this forgetful functor has both adjoints, and what I need now is that for suspension spectra, the left adjoint can be described in a particular way. So here's how the story went. 
that should be a compact Lie group. Then we have the forgetful functor. That I wrote at UG from the global stable homotopy category to the G equivalent stable homotopy category. And I explained that this has both adjoints. Moreover, the left adjoint evaluated at the unreduced suspension spectrum of a G space can be described in a particular way. If A is a cofibrant G space, we constructed a specific morphism that I want to denote eta now from the unreduced suspension spectrum of A to the underlying G spectrum of the unreduced suspension spectrum of L V comma blank cross over G A and this morphism was in the G equivalent stable homotopy category. So the morphism really came from a zigzag on the point set level map. One was a G equivalent stable equivalence in the wrong direction and on the G equivalent stable homotopy category you got a morphism in this direction. As usual, this V is a choice of faithful G representation and the choice is irrelevant for the arguments. And then we showed that by pre-composing with this morphism you get a bijection, so that's basically making the fact explicit that this object is the value of the left adjoint on the suspension spectrum, so this induces a natural bijection. for all y in the global stable homotopy category on the one hand side between the morphism group in the g-equivalent stable homotopy category from the suspension spectrum of A into the underlying g-spectrum of y. Pre-composition with this and applying the functor ug is an isomorphism to morphisms in the global stable homotopy category from sigma infinity plus L. E G blank cross over G with A in 2Y. So this was my notation for morphisms in the global state homotopy category. So in other words, this bijection exhibits this particular global spectrum as the image of the left adjoint on the suspension spectrum of A. We will now use this for G being the orthogonal group. We use this for G equal O of N. And then as the faithful representation, I will take the tautological representation. Um, and now we're going to consider an orthogonal space. Construction. Let x be an orthogonal space. And we have an OM equivalent map. OM equivalent projection from the value of x at r to the m onto the quotient by the latching space modulo Lm of x induces a morphism of suspension spectra equivalent suspension spectra from sigma infinity plus of xr to the m, so unreduced suspension spectrum here, to sigma infinity without a plus, because this is already a based space, rm modulo lmx. Now, in the splitting theorem, we will operate under the hypothesis that this map has a section in the OM equivalent stable homotopy category. So let's suppose that we have this. Suppose that Sm from the suspension spectrum of x r to the m modded out by the latching space to sigma infinity plus x at rm is a section to this projection in the OM equivariant stable homotopy category to the projection. 
So this map always exists on the point set level. It comes from the model that we're working with orthogonal spaces. This one you already have. This will typically, in the examples, not be a map like this on the point set level, but it will exist in the equivalent state homotopy category. So now what can we do with such a section? The choice of OM equivalent embedding linear isometric from R to the M with a tautological action into the complete universe of OM induces an OM map by applying our orthogonal space to this from X to the RM to X evaluated at the complete universe for OM. In the situations where we will apply this, the X will always be a closed orthogonal space. So this is the underlying OM space of the orthogonal space X. This choice of embedding is a contractible choice. We will pass to the homotopy category anyhow, so the choice of this embedding is irrelevant. Now we can look at the composite from sigma infinity x evaluated at Rm modulo Ln x. This section Sm that we're assuming exists in the OM equivalent state homotopy category to sigma infinity plus of x at Rm. And then we we'll go on with this map that depends on this choice of embedding, this contractible choice, to sigma infinity plus the underlying OM space of X. And this is also the underlying OM spectrum of the unreduced suspension spectrum of the orthogonal space. We let sigma M from the suspension spectrum of L of R and blank plus smash over OM evaluated on R to the M modulo L and X. This is in base OM space to sigma infinity plus of X with a morphism adjoint for the following composite. sigma infinity x of rm modulo the matching space via the section that we're assuming exists, which is of course a very special property to sigma infinity plus x of m. And then we go to sigma infinity plus of x evaluated at the complete OM universe via this choice of embedding from r to the m into the complete universe, and this is the underlying OM spectrum of the unreduced suspense spectrum of X. And as I explained on the beginning of the previous whiteboard, this construction is left adjoint to forgetting from global to OM equivalent, so this morphism has an adjoint up there. And now I can state the splitting in the abstract general form. Let X be a flat orthogonal space. that Sm from sigma infinity x evaluated at Rm modulo the matching space to sigma infinity plus x of Rm be a section through the projection in the OM equivalent stable homotopy category. We want this for all m greater or equal to zero. And then in this situation we get a splitting then the morphism sum of the sigma k's. So these are these adjoint morphisms going from the wedge over k greater or equal to zero from the suspension spectrum of L of R k comma blank, disjoint base points, smash 
over all k, x at r to the k, modulo to the kth latching space, each of these maps to sigma infinity plus x, and then this is an isomorphism in the global stable homotopy category. This is a very abstract splitting result with rather strong hypothesis. This hypothesis that this projection from the value at r to the m to r to the m module of the latching map admits a splitting in the OM equivalent stable homotopy category is a rather strong one that's generically not going to be satisfied. So this will only apply under very special hypothesis. The point is that in the next lecture I will show for the orthogonal space O, this hypothesis actually is satisfied, so there we can apply it. I would like to issue a little bit of a warning here. These, the values of an orthogonal space at R to the K and the latching spaces as O, K and spaces, these are not homotopical in global equivalences under X. So while this is by design something that sends global equivalences to isomorphisms in the global stable homotopy category, if you have a global equivalence from X to X prime, this will typically not be an OK equivalent equivalence here and here and on the quotients. So that means that the existence of this splitting is not really an invariant statement. It's tied to a particular model for a certain unstable global homotopy type as an orthogonal space. You know, in one particular model, the skeleton filtration might, might admit these splittings, but in a globally equivalent model, these splittings might not exist. So in some sense, you have to be lucky that for the global stable homotopy type you're interested in, there is a particularly nice point set level model where the skeleton filtration admits this argument. Given all the global tools that we have developed in previous lectures, the proof is not even that painful. So we argue by induction showing that for all n greater or equal to zero, the truncated version of this statement is true, namely the sum of the maps sigma m, but now the wedge only from k equal zero up to m, and now the same terms sigma infinity linear isometric invariance r to the k plus smash r to the k x at r to the k modulo the k latching map and now here we're going to the unreduced suspension spectrum of the m skeleton of x instead of x is an isomorphism in the global stable homotopy category This statement here that we want to prove inductively is actually a special case of the statement we're trying to prove because if x satisfies the hypothesis, also all the skeletal of x satisfy the hypothesis. So this is the special case of that statement applied to the m skeleton of x, but conversely we will prove this for all m and then this is just passing to the coordinate. So there's nothing to show for k equal minus 1. Then both sides are empty. If this seems mysterious to you, you can also start the induction at k equals zero, exploiting that uh, the zero skeleton is just uh, the constant orthogonal space with value x at zero. Now we do the inductive step. So now we assume that m is greater or equal to one. We exploit this push-out square that we have used earlier, r to the m blank cross r to the m, link mth latching object, going to the value of x at r to the m, going to the m-1 skeleton of x, going to the m skeleton of x. This is a push-out in the category of orthogonal spaces, so we can pass to the quotients in the horizontal direction and we get an isomorphism. based orthogonal spaces between skeleton mx modulo skeleton m minus 1x isomorphic to, and then I'm also pulling the uh, induced product over OM out, and I go to LM blank plus slash over OM, and here x r to the m modulo LMx. 
Because we've assumed that x is flat, the morphisms in these directions are actually level-wise closed embeddings, so these are particularly nice quotients. Because this morphism here is a flat co-fibration of orthogonal spaces, when we pass to suspension spectra, it becomes a flat co-fibration of orthogonal spectra. And that means that the actual quotient is globally equivalent to the mapping cone. So we get a distinguished triangle in the global stable homotopy category. Starting with the underused suspension spectrum of the skeleton M minus 1 of x going to the unreduced suspension spectrum of the skeleton M of X, and then going to the reduced suspension spectrum of L of R M blank plus smash over O M, the value of X at R to the M modulo the matching objects. And now I claim that the morphism sigma M is exactly a splitting to this last one. Sigma M is a section to the second morphism. This will conclude the proof, because if you have a distinguished triangle in any triangulated category and one of them has a section, then the triangle splits as the sum of this and this. For this, we have the inductive description as a wedge. And the extra summit is exactly what comes from here. So the induction then finishes the proof once I've shown that sigma m is a section to that morphism. To prove our final claim that sigma m is indeed a section to this composite, we look at the following commutative diagram. Here I have sigma infinity plus L of R m blank cross over OM, the value of x at R to the M. Then the morphism induced by the quotient map after passing to suspension spectra. Here I have sigma infinity plus skeleton M of x. This morphism comes from the co-unit of the adjunction between evaluating at Rm and its left adjoint, which is this, and then doing unreduced suspension spectrum. This goes to sigma infinity without a plus, skeleton Mx modulo skeleton M minus 1x. And this morphism here is an isomorphism that was a consequence of this push-out property. Sigma infinity L of Rm blank plus smash over OM, X at RM, modulo L and X. Sigma applied to the M skeleton of X is a morphism all the way from here to here. And now comes an innocent looking but quite subtle point in the argument, namely that we can actually put a morphism here. Here we can put the left adjoint to the forgetful functor from global to OOM equivalent stable homotopy theory applied to the morphism FSM, which is a morphism in the OOM equivalent stable homotopy category. And by design, sigma M was defined so that this factors. Also, SM was a section to the projection, so after applying LM to it, we can conclude that this map is the identity and this proves the fact that sigma is indeed a section to the projection. There is a subtlety in this argument that I want to make clear where we're actually significantly using the formalism that we've developed earlier. On the face of it, the functor L, R, M, blank, over O, M, and then sigma infinity plus is a functor in unstable O, M equivariant maps. Well, however, here we're applying it to a morphism S, M that only exists in the genuine stable O, M equivariant category. This S, M Will in, typical, will in general not come from an unstable morphism from this OM space to this OM space. So in order to know that we can put something here, that this expression makes sense, we need to know that this assignment is actually factorial in stable morphisms and not only in unstable morphisms. And that it is because this represents the left adjoint to the forgetful functor, and the forgetful functor is defined on the stable category. So this is a subtlety in the argument that we're crucially using the fact that this particular point set level construction is 
representing the left adjoint to the forgetful functor on suspension spectra of OM spaces. This concludes the proof of the abstract splitting result based on this strong hypothesis on the skeleton filtration. In the next lecture, I will verify that the hypothesis of the splitting result are satisfied for O and for certain generalizations of O. And then in particular, we'll get the global refinements of Miller's splittings. This is all I was planning to explain today. So as usual, I would like to close by thanking you for your attention. <laughs>